Noel Witherspoon Arnold, PhD, is an associate professor and director of the education doctorate at The Ohio State University. Go Bucks. She was a former program coordinator for the PK, PK through 12 education leadership uh, in the Department of Education Leadership and Policy Analysis at the University of Missouri Columbia, and also held assistant and associate professor appointments at the same time at Mizzou. She was also an assistant professor at Louisiana State University, where she was also the uh, co-director of the PhD program. A former administrator at the district and state level, Noel also currently serves as a consultant throughout the United States advising districts in analyzing data for school improvement, cultural me uh, mediation, STEM leadership for education, and teaching and leading in urban and rural contexts. Carol Mullen and Kim Robinson recently dedicated the book, Shifting to Fit, the Politics of Black and White Identity in School Leadership to Noel's status as the first Jackson Scholar to serve on the Executive Committee and the first African-American female to serve as president for UCEA. Noel has over 40 publications, and her articles have appeared in the Journal of Higher Education, Teachers College Record, International Journal of Leadership and Education, International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, the Journal of Education Administration, History, Equity and Excellence in Education, the Journal of Negro Education, International Journal of Educational Reform, and the Journal of Educational Administration, just to name a few. Noel has, count them, nine books published or in press, including Ordinary, Theologic, Religio Spirituality, and the Leadership of Black Female Principles, Anti-Racist School Leadership, with friend Jeffrey Brooks, and the Critical Friends Expressions for Education Leadership with Sarah Dean. Most recently, Noel completed the International Handbook of Urban Education Leadership with friends Muhammad Khalifa, Azadeh Osanlu, and Cosette Grant Overton. Noel is currently the series editor of the New Directions in Education Leadership, uh, Innovations in Research, Teaching, and Learning, along with series, series um, co-editor Emily Crawford, for Information Age Publishing. Noel was also an assistant editor of the International Journal of Leadership in Education. Noel is currently conducting two studies on the role of urban principals and student health disparities in education leadership and crisis in disaster areas. She is busy. Noel is a two-time nominee for both the Jack Coberson Award uh, for the University Council for Education Administration and Division A Emerging Scholar Award, um, American Education, uh, Education Research Association. She is the recipient of the Outstanding Review of the Year 2009-2010 Journal of School Leadership and honorable mention in the New Digest uh, International Who's Who in Academia uh, in 2013. Noah has, also, Noah has um, served as expert on, uh, on a number of issues uh, in national uh, uh, research. So uh, with all of that, I can just say as a friend and as somebody who has been supportive and been a leader on the, in the, uh, on the executive committee and of this organization, uh, Noelle is just uh, fantastic. So I'm uh, very proud to have known her and to watch her, uh, to watch her really uh, ascend to the position of presidency. So uh, with that, we're going to uh, invite uh, someone to come up uh, we'd like to invite uh, a person who wants, who was a Jackson Scholar with Noel to give, uh, just uh, share a few words. Her name is Latisha Reed. Latisha, come on up. Latisha wanted to contribute to this, to this introduction because she knows just how much the Jackson Scholar program, um, the Jackson Scholars program has meant to Noel and how much Noel believes in student advocacy. advocacy. Foremost, Latisha has personally seen Noel undergo risk to create dignity for others. Thank you, Dr. Gooden, for being a regal role model, a friend, and a mentor. At the beginning of the semester, um, I was scrolling through the Book of Life. No, actually, I was scrolling through my Facebook timeline. <laughs> and I saw this little sign. It said, speak your truth, 
even if your voice shakes. About a month later, Noel sent me a text asking me to participate in the introduction. I will tell you it was not a good day, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. I immediately texted her back and I said, absolutely not because this will probably be my last UCEA. You see, about a year ago, almost to the date, my tenure and promotion committee voted against my tenure and promotion in a 3-3 split vote. Despite the fact that in March of that year, I had been uh, ranked three out of the Department for Scholarship, Teaching, and Service, never mind the publications in JSL, QSE, the Journal of Negro Education, over $350,000 in grant funding, and a teaching award. Nonetheless, this year has been filled with shame, doubt, frustration, and anger. I've learned many lessons along the way. While I still do not understand how folks who prepare leaders can treat people in undignified and inhumane ways, I have learned that people will stand with you. One of those people currently leads this organization. I met the good president through the Linda Tillman, who was the Jackson Scholars Director at one point. Even though she, uh, this year has been filled with her UCEA presidential duties, her own work, as you heard, um, moving to a new institution, she was one of the core members of my team who supported me through this trying time. This is not her first time doing it. She has stood with many embattled faculty members. And I'm gonna tell you, she was talking about getting a plane ticket and getting on a plane to come to one of the meetings. Fired up and ready to go. At the end of the day, Noelle is a well-accomplished black woman who has broken many barriers, being the president of this great organization. But the thing that I most appreciate about her is that she didn't walk through the door and shut it behind her. She reached back for me she cared for me, she cares about me, whether I'm inside or outside of this academy. Noelle not only writes about social justice leadership, she embodies a social justice leader. Please welcome my friend, my sister, and the UCEA president, Dr. Noelle Witherspoon Arnold. So, um, yes, I have my sexy voice today. <laughs> um, sorry I couldn't be with you at the opening session. Um, I was being nursed back to health by my awesome husband. Uh, Bruce, I like to him to stand. Yes, this is the guy I always talk about. My own personal Florence Nightingale. Uh, he's just good at everything. He's annoying. Uh, yeah, he fixes our car. He, reads, he just reads a manual. He takes piano lessons. Two months, he sounds like he's been taking them forever. Um, but I'm really happy you're here with me, honey. Um, and I love you. So I, I blew off tons of people yesterday. Um, because of this voice. Um, but anyway, the great thing about feeling like you are near death the day before, you're not nervous about your speech anymore. So, <laughs> um, One of the things that one of my good friends said, uh, just look out at the audience and pretend that everybody's in their underwear. And yeah, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> so... Um, 
I have to thank Mark Gooden for just the awesome introductions. I've said it before, Mark. Um, you've just been pro-Noel. Um, you pick up the phone when I call. And um, in many ways, Mark has been a first amongst our age group. Um, and you've really been a great example. Um, Latish, you've been uh, a personal friend since we've been Jackson Scholars. Um, I took no pleasure in having to be on the phone with Latish last year and a lot of other scholars um, that went through similar experiences. Um, but I am my mama's kid and um, I can't seem to shut my mouth uh, when things like that happen. Um, there have just been so many people who have given to me personally and professionally that there's always a fear um, that I forget somebody at a time like this. So um, I want to just show um, the divas, uh, the person uh, with the headdress on because she likes shiny things is my mother Jacqueline. Um, the other person in the middle is my aunt, who am I named that I, I'm named after. And um, the person on the end is my grandmother. Um, if you know me, one of the things that you know about me is the thing that gives me the most consternation is when I fail, feel like I failed to do something. And um, I can thank them for that. Um, when you watch people do dignity work for you, it's difficult for some of that not to rub off on you. Um, I also want to remember a few people who are no longer with us. Uh, this is my brother, Jamad. We used to call him Ra-Ra. Um, Ra-Ra told me a few weeks before I defended that he was proud of me, and he was my younger brother. Um, I was the first in my family, the whole family, uh, to go to college. But um, right before Ra Ra passed away, um, he was studying for his LSAT. And so I like to think I sort of had something uh, to do with that. Um, I'm not saying this for me. I'm saying this in praise of him. Uh, he had an amazing spirit and an amazing heart. And um, Jamad passed away from the heart defect that he was born with two days before I defended my dissertation. Um, but I went in that room, I said, I'm not um, postponing this, this is for him, and I'll break down later. Um, this is my former mentor, Harold Bishop. Um, some of you may remember Dr. Bishop, um, and if you remember Dr. Bishop, he was larger than life. Um, but he always told me, and let me see if I can still do an impression of him with my horse voice, Noel, you a star. <laughs> and he said it just like that. Um, he was probably responsible for most of us of color who joined the department um, at the University of Alabama, um, and I still miss him. Um, the next slide is a picture of my nephew. Uh, some of you may or may not know, at the beginning of the school year, last year, um, my nephew took his own life. Um, he was beautiful, brilliant. Uh, he was an amazing friend and advocate for others. And no one knew his struggle, not even us. Um, we found out more now, and certainly no one is to blame. Um, None of us have to be therapists or psychiatrists or even necessarily equipped to deal with some of the issues that are facing marginalized issues. But we all are capable of doing dignity. I know the personal and professional agency that I have experienced because of it. So I believe in saying thank you. I appreciate your support. I appreciate your help. I'm sure at some point I've also said, help, I don't know what I'm doing. If I have ever, ever said those words to you, called you on the phone, showed up at your house, fussed or cussed about something to you, you know who you are. You know what you've done. You know what you mean to me. And you know that I know what you've been for me. I love you, and I wholeheartedly thank you. So I had some... Uh, 
the most fun and challenging times on the executive committee and the growth I've gained from all of you has been tremendous. So um, I have a name for the UCA executive director. Where is she? Yes, she's right here in front. And the name I call her is The Beast. And um, it's a sign of affection. Um, but um, I don't even know if everybody in this room knows what Michelle um, does for this organization. And Michelle, I just personally want to tell you, I've learned a lot from you. Um, it's one thing to be the steward of an organization's operations, but it's another thing to be a steward and a mediator for everybody's values and to do it with some grace and tact. Um, like to give a shout out to Pam Tucker. Um, I call Pam Tucker the Secretary of State. Um, I have begun to call her the consigliere because she might be given some orders to kill some people. <laughs> Do not be messing with people at headquarters. Um, by the way, when my voice gets better, I do an excellent impression of Pam when she is embarrassed at the EC shenanigans. Lastly, um, I just want to tell everybody in this room to bow down to the team at UCA headquarters. You don't even know. Um, be kind to them and be grateful and make it so that they are able to do what they do with dignity or Pam will give the order. <laughs> so um, let me recognize the convention um, committee. Um, I want to recognize President um, Monica Birne Jimenez. I learned how to pronounce her name for real um, this past summer, and I think it's sexy. Um, Holly Mackey, Cheryl Ward, and Irene Yoon. I know what it is to plan a convention. Most excellent job. So um, I also ask that you indulge me while I tell a few stories that might center on kids, organizations, or colleagues, my family, or other things. But please know that all of these stories have their grounding in dignity work. So um, as president, you start thinking about your speech for a while. Um, Malu Gonzalez said to tell my story. Andrea Rohrer said to speak about something you're passionate about. Monica said to decide how much of me I want to reveal. Cindy Reed said to talk about my work. So in some ways, I'll do a little bit of all of this. Um, Last year, I think Mark did, did good and did such a service to the organization by reminding us all of the history um, of UCA and ways in which we have evidenced the efforts of equity. However, this year, I want to engage in the inquiry process um, that UCA governance has in initiated and have you consider the value and the promise of UCA. I want you to also consider your role in the continuing evolution of the organization. And so with this speech, I aim to accomplish four goals. The goals are to discuss um, what I feel is we're living in a time of dignity disparity. Um, I also want to discuss the intersectionality of meaningful risk and courageous movement. I also want to discuss what I think we can learn from the movement generation. And finally, I want to discuss placing dignity at the core of our work. Um, I see Dakota Irby sitting up here, and I have to give a shout out to Dakota Irby because I started reading his work on dignity, um, and I have to let you know I didn't just take your stuff, um, but it inspired me to start thinking about what I do in a different way. So Dakota, just stand up, let people see your face. So um, I'll start with a little story. 
Um, how many of you have freaked out the first time you heard your mother's voice come out of your mouth? Um, you saw the picture of my mama. Um, this is a woman who embarrassed me and my siblings more times than I can even count because she does not care who you are. She will get in your face. Am I right, Bruce? Okay. Um, which is really funny because she's like five feet tall, 100 pounds. She wears like a five and a half shoe. Um, but one thing is, you will not mistreat people. You will not mistreat people in front of her. Um, she's been known to say bad words. Um, she's been known to hit people. That's another story. Um, but I also watch my mom um, raise a large family of her own and take food out of her freezer and give it to people in our neighborhood. So um, my mom has a rare heart condition. Um, and she was famous in the hospital for a little while because they've never seen this heart condition in black women before, so she was loving that. Um, but she had her first heart attack in 2007. And of course, they called the ambulance. And in Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up, uh, you have a choice of um, two different hospitals on our side of town. So on one side of town, they take you to a hospital if you have insurance. And on another side of town, they take you to a hospital if you don't have insurance. So um, they did take my mom to the hospital that does have insurance because it was closer and um, she was in distress. However, um, in a rush, my brother forgot to grab my mom's purse and it had her insurance card in there denoting her excellent military insurance. So um, my mom was a, assigned a doctor who stabilized her and she was admitted to intensive care. And so my siblings and I arrived and we started asking questions um, and we had notebooks to write everything down because um, we wanted to get everything right. And I don't know another way to say this um, and you might not want to put this in the transcript, but the doctor was a punk, okay? Um, he was the most disrespectful person I think I've ever met. Um, now don't go messing with our mama, right? Um, so I asked him to leave. I said I wanted to see somebody in charge and we wanted a different doctor. Um, and so when the new doctor arrived, she looked at the chart and she got this really weird look on her face. Uh, and she said, you know, I wonder why they assigned this doctor. Um, he's usually assigned to people who don't have insurance. Now let's just break this down for just a minute. Um, my mother came in the middle of the night, she had on her pajamas, black woman, no purse, but just my brother, and an assumption was made. Um, and she went from being the loudest mouth in the room to the most vulnerable and the most silenced. I tell you this story because these things happened right when I got my job at LSU in 2007. And prior to that, I had been consulting um, with school districts in Alabama and Louisiana um, right after Hurricane Katrina. And I won't go into a lot of detail, um, but I think my work took a large turn after that. And I began really considering community disparity and what kind of real realities those had for the people in those communities. Um, and so I think Mark mentioned that I've been examining leadership and crisis and disaster for longer than I have wanted to, but things keep happening. Um, and I've also been examining leadership roles um, in school and community-based health clinics um, and, um, or, you know, the role that the leader has um, in dealing with health um, disparity. But um, because of Dakota's work and some other people's work, I started looking at it in a different way. I started looking at it as really dignity disparity. Um, how are educators dealing with dignity disparity? How do they integrate services, engage in transcultural advocacy, curriculum interventions, and create a school culture that supports community dignity. 
So part of what the executive committee has been doing the past year is sort of revisioning and reimagining the workings of UCEA. So let me give you an example of how um, I think this has worked in a community that's really important uh, for me. me you see I have in my medicine cabinet up here on the table but thanks for indulging me and in looking at uh, that video um, I know a lot of the people that are in that video um, I grew up in Woodlawn um, I went to Oliver Elementary School I went to Woodlawn High School and I invested in a lot of what they've been doing because of course that community means a lot to me um, when my mother was growing up uh, Woodlawn was considered the white middle-class community. She could not attend school there. Um, so she, even though the school was a few blocks from her house, she had to pass by that school and go to Hayes High School, which was the black high school. Um, fast forward a little bit, my mom's younger siblings went to Woodlawn and more black athletes uh, attended Woodlawn. It's another story. Uh, in fact, my cousin, um, the daughter of my aunt, who I'm named after, was the first black cheerleader at Woodlawn. So fast forward a little bit more, white families had moved on, businesses left the community, and there were troubling statistics in the school and the community. And fast forward a little bit more. Um, Sally will tell you that this has not been an easy road. Um, when I emailed her a year ago, um, here is how I wanted to characterize what I think they did. Fundamentally, I think it began with um, an appreciation of what was great about the community and schools, valuing the dignities and destinies of individuals rather than counting all the risks, because a lot of people did, and prioritizing and revisioning and restoring over remaining where they were. And Gonna give a plug for UCA's AI mission. <laughs> um, and so some of you know that um, UCA has been participating in appreciative inquiry. Um, don't roll your eyes. Um, but part of what this appreciative inquiry has been has been um, taking us to a, a different level in thinking about um, UCA and, and what we uh, want to see it do. And so there have been these four questions um, that we've been asking ourselves as an EC, but also that we've been doing um, with the PSRs. Um, and so if you don't know about the appreciative inquiry process, I encourage you to ask your PSR um, about this process. But one of the things I think uh, we've been doing is thinking dip deeply uh, about UCA's mission how we advocate and affect change for underrepresented groups, the significance of participation in UCA, and how UCA can continue to evolve to positively impact educational leadership and policy. And there were some themes that came from that process. And now we're at this stage of what is called provocative propositions. And it sounds sexy. Um, and even though um, these provocative propositions sound sexy, I think it also um, comes with a little bit of risk. Um, Helen Keller once wrote something that I think makes me understand uh, my mama a little bit more. She wrote, character can't be developed in ease and quiet. Don't get me wrong, I like ease and quiet. I'm an extrovert, I'm an introvert who masquerades as an extrovert, and you've heard me say that. But anyway, I got this idea of meaningful risk and courageous movement from her. So Frank Farley is a psychologist at Temple University. He spent most of his career studying what he labeled the T-type thrill-seeking personality. 
The T-type personality is the kind of person who loves taking risks, who seeks stimulation, excitements, and thrills in life. We've become a risk-averse society. I admit, I'm one of those people who now travel with wet wipes and wipe down armrests and tray tables when I'm on a plane. Um, it makes me feel like I'm not being as risky. I did that, but I still have a sore throat. Um, I have uh, chronic migraines and I'm on preventative medicine. I've taken them for a while now, but I read over the, farm, um, the paperwork the pharmacist gives me every single time. It says the same thing, but I read over it every single time because I want to make sure I didn't forget something that could kill me. So, but can we really rearrange ourselves in such a way that we avoid all risks? How many of you have ever used a vending machine? Raise your hand. <laughs> so sorry. Vending machines kill 13 people annually. How many of you take baths? Bathtubs kill 340 people annually. I bet right now you're saying, well, dang, I might as well not even get out of bed. Well, I got bad news for you. <laughs> Falling out of bed kills 450 people annually. <laughs> so things like baths and beds are necessary risks. However, what about those risks that are not necessarily necessary? Some risks we take, we make the conscious decision to do. How many of you ski? Okay, I don't, but how many of you swim? And by the way, I took swimming lessons after being deathly afraid of water for most of my life, and yay, I'm still alive to give this speech. How many of you go to the zoo? So sorry, hippos kill 2,900 people annually, and they're so cute. Um, but my point is, is that these are risks you're intentional about taking. You choose them. But being a type T personality doesn't necessarily equal taking meaningful risk. And what if you don't have a type T personality? You're still not allowed to be a bench warmer. And how does an organization even become meaningful risky? What does that even mean? Mona Lisa, not Mona Lisa, reveals that many of our strategies and initiatives that we think are risk and resistance are really more so just accidental, just resistance byproducts, unintended spinoffs that we like to constitute as movement. These strategies are only mere adjustments. She says that there must be deep paradigmatic revisioning for these strategies to become meaningful. Any collective action involves the calculation of the advantages of risks and is geared toward meaningful goals. So meaningful risk isn't always about formal or informal sort of protests. But movement occurs when we are intentional. So the first thing I think we do is rethink words and languages of the organization that say to a watching world that we are risk averse. Does the language of our bylaws and policies or does the language of our conventions say that we color outside of the lines? And by the way, I had a ribbon made for me that says, I color outside of the lines. Does our language indicate that everybody assume leadership on marginal issues? Movement and risk has to come from many places. But does our language signal that this courage only come from the most vulnerable people? At one time in UCA's history, 
I'm sure some people saw risk here. Do we know who these people are? Famous firsts. First African American president. First LBGTQI president. First Latino president. The Jackson Scholar Program. Our own executive director that we have now. First female. Again, movement and risk has to come from many places. But in what ways does our language signal that this courage only come from the most vulnerable people? Any collective action involves the calculation of advantages and risk and is geared toward meaningful goals. But meaningful goals, again, occurs when we are intentional. I think back to what Letitia was saying earlier about um, tenure and promotion. I spent all of last year in hearings with people in our field who were denied ten tenure and promotion. A lot of these people were people from marginalized groups and I couldn't understand it because by all accounts and purposes, um, their CVs were amazing. I'm not just saying this because I love them, but I'm saying as a field, in what way have we said that this is not acceptable to do this to our people? Hello, can I get a witness? Right? And what I think is happening is it's happening more in educational leadership departments. There's something about um, our field that's becoming devalued in these AAU metrics and in other type of metrics that seem to matter in universities. And I think it's going to take more than just one or two voices saying, these are our people. There's scholarship here. There's worth here. And I was frankly disheartened that I was going to hearings all year and there were only four of us going continuously. I spent time in 12 hearings all year and I was exhausted. Again, I was willing to fly to Latish. But what I wanted to see was more people in our field say, this isn't okay. These are our people. And where I found that the most courage was coming from in having those conversations were the very people who were the most vulnerable in those situations. I'm gonna leave that right there. So what do I think we do as an organization? What is courageous movement? We normalize risk. We get rid of words that have become ambiguous. We assert that there's dignity in difference. And we engage in civil discourse courageously. The individuals that I showed you on the previous slide, they highlight this organization's journey to normalizing risk and recognizing dignity and difference. We've had conversations and meetings that I think that have engaged us in courageous conversations. But I wonder what risks have we yet to take? What new actions do we need to begin to take? The millennial generation has been dubbed the movement generation in a recent article in The Nation. And by now, you've all seen the events as my, at my former university, the University of Missouri. I ask right now that you put aside your personal opinion on what is happening. First, let me say that I will sick Pam on you. <laughs> um, but there are many people there that I love 
including faculty and students, and my heart has always been with them and continues to be. And I want to recognize the people I worked with in the Educational Leadership and Policy Department. Um, I was privileged to work with critical and compassionate folks um, whose work was congruent with their lives. Um, I've now been at The Ohio State for four months, 22 days, and 37 seconds. Don't be impressed, I'm not that accurate. <laughs> um, but I'm lucky once again to work where I think every meeting has been centered on taking care of students, and I appreciate that. Let me just say to the Mizzou students, I see you. I see you. And to others who are in similar places, I see you too. I remain in contact with students and faculty who've been involved in the movement at Mizzou and ask their um, permission to mention these happenings today. There's no desire to co-opt their stories, but I do feel a sense of ownership because I've spent five years there um, recruiting these scholars of color, fighting to create space for women and faculty of color, and quite frankly, advocating for equitable anti-racist policy. Make no mistake, these issues we are seeing are not peculiar to Mizzou or any one university or organization. The work has to be done and has to continue everywhere. The Pew Research Center describes millennials as America's most racially diverse generation. In a recent study by John C. Rogowski at Washington University and Kathy Cohen at the University of Chicago indicate that the issues raised by activist groups such as Black Lives Matter did not spontaneously emerge in response to the shooting deaths of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, but rather reflected widespread experiences and beliefs among young people of color. Another disturbing finding is that a majority of youth of color experiences have been largely shaped by violence, including physical, social, economic, and political issues, such as unemployment, health care, immigration reform, crime, community policing, incarceration, and issues with the legal system. Moreover, the entire millennial generation has been dubbed the movement generation. Is it any wonder that they've been named such when trauma after trauma, indignity after indignity, have defined the late adolescence and early adulthood of their generation. I asked a few of the graduate students and some of the Jackson scholars to give a few quotes that I wanted to share with you today. And here's what they had to say. To be a person pushed into the margins of society, every single move you make is one of calculated risk. The reason we take risk, the reason we continue on in the movement toward justice and equity as defined and constructed by those who are marginalized and minoritized within our society is for the love of those gone. For the love of ourselves and for the love of the future, continuing on in a legacy of dignity in the face of the worst generations. Our dignity is our ability to look in each other's eyes and the eyes of the little ones and tell them that we uplifted our voices to the highest of heights and banded together to change our current realities. Our movement builds and transforms one risk at a time. Here's another. Movements are young people's inheritance in America. Young people at the margins and young people who do not accept the marginalization of their friends and of their families and of their, and of their communities are confronting old ideas and systems. Risk their education, their reputation, they risk their quiet, all to move. Another said, we know our voice, and fortunately, for the sake of the colleagues who think we won't make a difference, 
and the future generation whose success and dignity depend on us doing just that, we are just getting started. And that student put emphasis on that. But it is heartening that this generation is working to reappropriate. They're reappropriating aggression to agency, margin to movement, routines into risk, and discrimination into dignity. I was contacted recently um, by several media groups and individuals on the um, MU campus for my input on some of the issues. And here's what I said. And at first I didn't want to say anything because I was feeling all the feels, you know? But one of the things I said was, ask before you ally. Anna Post once said, we have a way of opting into others' environments when we are really there to listen. Diversity is nothing without anti-oppressive policy. Policy outlasts platitudes. Do not conflate issues. There is no doubt that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. However, take care not to conflate issues. It's okay to just let race issues be about race. And lastly, and this is where I felt a little bit of consternation, for God's sakes, be honest about your intentions. Do not use a legitimate and very real issue as an opportunity to advance your own agenda. If you have a demand that has nothing to do with the issue at hand, do not capitalize on that crisis. Before you opt into others' environments, ask yourself a simple question. What is your objective? Those living in what I call communities without capital, grow up and learn in spaces and places where they experience multiple assaults to their sense of dignity. And their living and learning emerge from experiences in indisposed places in which schools are located and the dynamics of the schools and classrooms themselves. Former Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan recently said this in response to South Carolina school officer Ben Fields flipping a female student backwards from her desk and throwing her across the room. If we want to maintain the trust of parents and communities in our schools, we must start by treating our children with respect and human dignity. Duncan's quote is prevalent now more than ever. And here's the sad part. There are just too many examples. I have already discussed so many indignities in which the body becomes sites where indignities are visited, in which we create and maintain undignified communities. It's not enough to respond with righteous anger, but also with empathy as a political act that fuels agency and activism, as the convention co-chairs reminded us in their call. Barbara Kingsolver wrote, the creation of empathy is a political act. The ability to understand and really feel for people who are different from ourselves, that is a world-changing event. Egyptian author Abdef Suif writes, putting yourself in another's shoes itself is a political act. Empathy is at the heart of revolutionary action. Byram said, it's action-oriented to intercultural communication, travel beyond our borders, both figuratively and literally, and dignity is power dismantling. I've been reading a volume by Julia Hall entitled Underprivileged School Children and the Assault on Dignity. And the book talks about educational renewal and human dignity and how that will get us beyond the blockages and the contradictions, the stuck points of human dignity. When we do that, we can have broad-based movement that does not separate what we think we might be doing morally right, just with education, from what needs to be done morally in public life. Even with all that is asked of us, it is not outside of our commitments or the expectations of us 
to wage war against indignity. Guattari, Sheed, and Cooper coined the term molecular revolution to describe various local movements and actions. And the authors say that each movement is like a molecule linked in a network and matrix of other molecules to produce something greater than the sum of its parts. But these social movements, critiques, and resistance don't change things themselves. It must have policy initiatives in which silencing, limitations, despair, and lack of dignity are no longer normal parts of life. And one thing way um, I think that UCA has been instrumental is in Michelle Young's work on the professional standards of educational leaders. Seems like a small thing. But one thing that I like is that UCA faculty came together and signed a letter reiterating the importance of certain values being front and center in those standards. And this enabled Michelle and others in that group to say, the field is spoken, we are going to do dignity first. So um, I grew up in Birmingham, and it's tough to find an area in what's called Old Birmingham where the civil rights movement did not leave its mark. And Kelly Ingram Park is just across the street from 16th Street um, Baptist Church. Um, Kelly Ingram Park is also a central stage and ground um, for central rights movement. It was also where Bull Connor ordered police dogs on children and high school students during the Children's March. And there are statues of MLK and Fred, Fred Shuttlesworth. It also has sculptures of three pastors kneeling in prayer. The Birmingham Civil Rights Institute now adjoins the park. And there are often family festivals and cultural events that are held there. But when I was younger, I hated to go. The sculpture scared me, and it was sort of like a cemetery to me. Couldn't understand why anybody would want to go there. Now, I see things a little bit differently. I see it as a little patch of green dignity. A refusal to forget the least of these and to grant dignity in memoriam that they were delight in life. The homeless sleep in the park and nobody disturbs them. The homeless watch over the park and nobody disturbs it. And they grant dignity to one another. September marked the 52nd anniversary of the 16th Street Church bombing that killed Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair. And this is one of my favorite sculptures in the park. Dakota Irby and his colleagues describe dignity work as a body of research, policy, and practice that centers on dignity as its guiding principle, but also as its indicator of success. The underlying theory is that change and improvement is produced by treating others as human beings, no matter their state, condition or behavior. How do we treat others as human beings? Urban associates say they must be intentional efforts to understand and eliminate all subjective experiences and conditions of oppression, humiliation, and degradation. Irby reminds us that although inherent dignity is inviolable and cannot be stripped, a person's sense of dignity can. We must address dehumanizing at personal, systemic, and institutional levels. Dignity is not decided. Dignity is inherent. And we often act as though dignity is something we donate or deign to deliver. The Dignity in Schools campaign published a model code in 2012. While their work was specifically in response to zero tolerance policies in schools, I think their principles have some important implications for us as well. The model code is organized into five major parts, a commitment to education, participation, dignity, freedom from discrimination, and monitoring and accountability. And for us, it might mean educating around marginalizing issues, participation through investment by dealing with tough issues and not just expectation for other groups to do it. Incorporating dignity as an explicit value 
and goal, creating anti-discriminatory practice and monitoring our progress on these issues, but also holding one another and the organization accountable when we fail to do so. UCEA can learn much from Irby and his colleagues' dignity framework in our revisioning process, but also as a way to examine how our policy and initiatives may or may not be dignity-oriented. So let me end with a few things. UCEA is a consortium focused on leadership preparation, policy, research, and practice. But I like something that we've been discussing more often in the executive committee sessions, and that is our status as a nonprofit. And Gail says, says nonprofits have a call for a humane and noble purpose. First, I'd like to recognize a small group of individuals who came together, I did not forget, and conceptualized the Jackson Scholars Program. I am fully convinced that any um, big part of any perceived success that I've had, and I'm convinced that it indeed was the making of a movement in UCA. I personally thank you. If you had anything to do with that, please stand so the others in this room can recognize you. Do it. <laughs> I know Malu Gonzalez is in here. I know some other people are in here. Anyway, you are why I work so hard, take on a million Jackson scholars and too many dissertation advisees. I know the importance of and spill a feel a responsibility to pay it forward with a vengeance and until it hurts. Thank you to all the Jackson Scholar mentors Bruce Barnett, I know you're in the audience. Let me acknowledge you are a great Jackson Scholar mentor. Bruce, stand up. And other Jackson Scholar mentors, if you'll please stand. You are so important to this process of doing dignity. I just want to encourage you when you're exhausted from all you do, you can read another dissertation or return another email or phone call. Do it one more time <laughs> for your Jackson Scholar. And certainly all the graduate students are important and deserve our attention. Um, I just want to say to um, the graduate students and the Jackson Scholars, when one person found out I was sick yesterday, I got like 50,000 texts from the graduate students. Um, thank you for all the love. Um, people I don't even know were texting me like, you are gonna be great. Your voice is coming back. We rebuke it. <laughs> we are praying, hallelujah. Um, but um, thank you guys, I, I really appreciate that. But I'm grateful that the Jackson Scholars Program and the other um, graduate programs continues to recognize mentoring those in the margins, but mentoring those in general. My immediate thought in response to the convention theme brings me to another term that is not necessarily an explicit part of the theme, but certainly captures the spirit I would like us to consider. The term is transpersonal. The transpersonal is a term used by philosophy and psychology in order to describe experiences and worldviews that extend beyond one's own personal level of psyche. It has been defined as experiences in which the sense of identity or self extends beyond the personal to encompass the wider humankind, life, or cosmos. And this is what I thought of in response to this theme. This is what I have thought about in thinking of Paris or the bombing in Nigeria just this week. The second thing I've thought about is that transnational concerns are not the concerns of people over there. When we shift our focus and see leadership and education 
as pillars of dignity that impact the world's children regardless of any one nation state. It forces us to cultivate diverse strategies for who we partner with, inclusion strategies, and methods of understanding among different groups. So what are UCA's strategies we have yet to find? Who might we partner with? Who and how do we include? What are our methods of understanding? Benjamin Lamott said, respect and dignity are not just feelings, they are actions. We have to do dignity. Make bearable the indignities of everyday life. It is my hope that we all turn into my mama, that we invoke, intervene, and we interfere. interfere. Thank you. And now I am ready for a mimosa. Meet me in the back. Thank you, guys. <laughs>